trestle table, popular in the medieval era for its quick assembly during large castle gatherings, and a symbol for wealth and status as the evolution of designs took place. Lately, I've been drawn towards Gothic architecture, though. The strong pointed arches, the intense rib vaulted ceilings, and of course, the iconic flying buttresses are some of the most beautifully designed structural elements known to man. So join me as I take a crack at it to merge these two prospects and build a Gothic inspired trestle table. In the last video, I showed you how to do perfect brass inlays without a CNC, but I didn't show you how the tabletop was made. So in this part of the series, we will be working with Bolivian Rosewood or Murado to build an 11 foot tabletop. And with a quick taste test, we can get started. I was lucky to find some quality lumber for this project two years ago, because it was originally intended for a baby grand piano build. But she says we need a table, not a piano. So I guess I'll start by cutting off any checked ends or cracks from this well acclimated wood. It's important to know if your lumber is kiln dried or not, because I think most of us would prefer our bugs to be dead. Since Murado is more than three times the cost of walnut where I live, I only purchased four quarter stock to work with for my piano. Now that it's going to be a tabletop, I have to be very patient when milling so I don't wind up with a thin and weak top. I managed to keep everything over 13 16 thick and Murado is some dense and heavy material as it is, so that will be more than enough strength. I don't want these boards to warp again after exposing fresh moisture though, so I need to cut them to final width, then stack and sticker them to acclimate for the weekend. Patience is key in this project for me. This wood has a lot of color and grain variants, and to achieve an artistically balanced product, I'm definitely going to have to sort them by color so I can distribute them evenly across the different panels and leaves. I ended up sorting more based off of value or darkness rather than color to avoid having 12 different complicated piles of colors and grains that would only make things harder for me. Instead, this produced three simple piles that I can now start to pull from to make the two primary tabletop slabs. I take my time on this process, flipping each piece end for end or upside down until it flows well with the last board. I also didn't forget to check the two boards that will eventually meet when the tabletop is closed. I used all of the nicest boards on the two primary tops because this table won't have the leaves installed most of the time. So this gives me a chance to use some of the harder to match boards on the three leaves. Now everything can be fine tuned on the joiner so each joint is nothing short of perfect. I show how to do this with a hand plane in my grand feature wall video. The 
dominoes only serve as an alignment tool, and I'm keeping them five inches from the edge so I don't cut into them when I'm cutting out the final shape of the top. Before gluing oily wood like this though, it would be a mistake to skip this next step. Cleaning any joints with acetone will remove any surface oils so the glue can penetrate a bit better. This is common with exotic woods like ebony, cocobolo, and many others. The clamping calls at each end ended up being a lifesaver. They kept every panel perfectly flat, and since I spent so much time on my joints, I didn't need a metric ton of force to clamp each panel up. But then, this happened. I know you're probably thinking, wow, Corey, you know skilled karate too? Yeah. Moving onward and inward, let's scrape the glue squeeze out so the panels don't get stuck in the planer. I'm forever grateful to have a planer that can handle 25 inch wide boards, so I utilize this as an asset in my projects. For anyone without this capability, I would either go right to hand sanding with an orbital or pay a shop to sand the finished tabletop through a big industrial drum sander. There's my favorite board. Up until this point, I produced panels that were roughly 24 inches wide, and I need to joint some of them together to create the two halves of the tabletop. I will be doing inlays though, and don't want to be reaching over the giant slabs to do my inlay work. So the solution is to dry fit them together without glue. That way I can continue the rough shaping process, then I'll pull them apart when it's time for the inlays. The next step before the inlay process is to drill for the locating pins. If you've ever used a table with a leaf, the locating pins keep each panel in alignment and coplanar with one another. For this, I made a quick drilling guide. Each half of the guide corresponds with whether that end gets pins or holes. I do wish I made this guide out of metal, because wood has some give and gets worn, which in the end I got a pretty good alignment, I'm just recommending metal if you want it to be astonishingly perfect. and I unfortunately ended up breaking one of the soft brass pins with a steel hammer. Duh. It's always something, and it always feels pretty tragic. Like, what do I do from here? Did I just blow it? And that's when slowing down for me is really important. Stop what I'm doing, brainstorm solutions, then pick my head up and get it fixed so that I can keep going. In this case, I am miraculously able to drill the brass right out. No problem. The new pin is a touch looser in the hole, so I check the alignment and force it upward by using a solution that is actually derived from an inherent problem. These X-Acto blades always break at the worst time, but now that I know that, it works great as a micro shim. 
Part one is an in-depth video of how to produce the intricate brass inlays that go in this top. So let's briefly take a look and there will be a link to that video as well as part three if it's out in the description below if you want to watch them after this. Inlay work is extremely satisfying, and I think every woodworker should try it at least once. So save that video to your watch later playlist, and let's get these panels glued up. The amount of hand sanding that went into getting these things level and flat was remarkable. An orbital would leave an uneven surface, even with a dense backing pad. But this means I sanded and sanded and sanded and... <laughs> but boy, was it worth it. Now the sides can be lightly trimmed to make everything nice and flush. When the leaves are pulled, the two table ends should line up flush as well. Since the odds are ever in my favor, I can finally cut the unique arched shape of this top. It honestly looks great as a rectangle, but Gothic architecture is like the opposite of modern. The rule is, if it's straight, add a curve to it. Then add a curve again, just for the hell of it. And if you're still questioning if you did it right, add another curve. Like I mentioned in the last video, these Laguna sanders are a big reason why I chose such a hard design in this project. Adding curves to practically every facet of this table is a hard thing to accomplish and as you'll see, the spindle and edge sander are quite helpful for many reasons. I'm also going to use this air cleaner in a unique way. Usually these are hung from the ceiling where they can clean the ambient air. But in my case, it's handy to use it to clean the localized air around where I work. Routing is a dusty process and you can see the fine dust being drawn into the filter rather than dispersed throughout the shop and my lungs. Murado is notorious for blowout in areas, even if I go slow. With most woods though, I usually expect to do a repair or two. I'm choosing a raised panel profile to route into the edges. This will give the impression of a thicker top, add to the gothic design because it adds a, you guessed it, a curve, and it will offer a softer contour for arms and elbows. So this bit doesn't have a bearing. So I had to make a guide off camera and mount it to the base plate 
That way I could make use of this bit that I like. All profiles will need a thorough sanding afterwards. You may think it came out smooth, but trust me, the finish will expose every flaw, so take your time and remember, patience is key. 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 <sighs> we learned that from my therapist in the NordFab video. Because we don't have control of others, the best thing we can do is have compassion and use patience as a tool for tolerance. That's some real s. Yep. I personally like the composition of boards that I created from one panel to the next, so I'm choosing to wood burn numbers on the bottom so I can set the leaves in order on future occasions. Then the latches can be mounted and tested. Now everything stays together. I did mention that an orbital can create an uneven surface and that might be confusing, especially in this next clip when I'm using one for my very final 220 grit sanding. Since brass sands at a different rate than wood, if you use an orbital for every step, you will end up with a variance between the height of the inlay and the wood. So sand with a hard block until the end then if needed, do a light once over with an orbital for the final pass. Before finishing, I tape off any brass pins and add spit wads to the holes. Just like the glue up, I need to clean every surface with acetone because I'm using a specialty water-based coating and I don't want adhesion issues. I performed tests of different finishes, some with oil underneath and others without. And I'm pleasantly surprised to report that a water-based coating looks the best for the look I'm trying to achieve. A nice dark brown with depth and contrast. This product is Envirothane 300 Clear in 20 sheen, and so far I have not been able to make it look good on walnut but it looks amazing on Murado. It may look like any ordinary water-based coating when it first goes on, but give it a minute to clear up and set in, then pucker up because dang, she looks good. And she looks amazing dry too. So before the final look, I'd like to thank you for your dedicated time and subscribe so you can join me in part three. And it's time for final shots. If I earned it, your subscription is free, and here's another awesome video to watch.